We're gathering at an extraordinary time. It's the months following the killing of George Floyd and the extraordinary opportunity that that gives us as we say that black lives can genuinely finally matter. And that's what brings us to a discussion of reparations and what does reparations mean for a preeminent global institution like Cambridge University. If we go back a bit and think of that period of emancipation when freed slaves or enslaved people finally got their freedom, then we might say that the 19th century was that century where freedom finally reigned. But of course, the whole of the 20th century was a century where they were still fighting for their rights, rights not to be colonized, rights not to experience segregation or apartheid or Jim Crow, rights to full employment, to housing, to healthcare. And in so many ways, we're still amidst many of that fight and for those rights today. But I think the opportunity that the debate around reparations gives us is that can we make for black lives to matter? Can we make the 21st century the century of repair? Truth, reconciliation and repair. And that's what makes this an exciting moment and an exciting conversation. And I guess to get to repair, it means fashioning not just with equality, but with equity. And so the question is, how do we bring those who are the descendants of those enslaved people to a better, stronger, more equitable position in society. And that means a university like Cambridge fashioning with its past, with the contribution it made to scientific racism, the development of those ideas and the legacy of those ideas that still live on today. And of course, it means reckoning with the wealth that was amassed, not just at the university, but throughout British society. How do you then work with those in a development context, particularly universities in the Caribbean, in the Americas, in the continent of Africa? How do we repair in a quantitative and qualitative way with those communities? And I'm joined by the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Hilary Beckles for this conversation and Sir Hilary Beckles' contribution to this debate about reparations over almost a generation is immense. I'm also joined by Olivet Otelli, who has written a fabulous book. I've got to tell you, please rush out and buy this book because it adds to the canon of literature in this area massively and it is so on of the moment. But Olivet is Professor of History uh, of Slavery and Memory of Enslavement at the University of Bristol. And we're joined by Shara Mahari, who is the president of the African Caribbean Society at the university. It's an interesting subject and there's no one more eminent really than Sir Hilary Beckles to open up this discussion with decades of academic experience, but also now sitting as the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. Hilary Beckles, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, David, for your kind comments. And let me say at the outset, it is, it is a pleasure for me to participate in this conversation, very important conversation it is for me as uh, a citizen, as a participant in the global reparatory justice movement, and also as, as an academic. 
whose career has been built around the issues of the rise of the the modern the modern world economy and the circumstances surrounding how that uh, global economy emerged uh, over the period of the 17th century through to the present. In effect, what we are speaking about is the, the legacy of a global colonial circumstance that had erupted in the Western context out of Europe. And the use of two instruments uh, in order to generate tremendous wealth for European and Western national development. The first of these is colonization, that it was used as a tool, a vehicle on which the Western economic structure would emerge competitively with the rest of the world and competitively between itself, England, France, the Netherlands, America, and so on internal competitiveness, as well as collective competitiveness, competitiveness in respect of, of Asia and, uh, and of course, uh, Africa. The bottom line is that colonization and its, its internal instruments, slavery, and what eventually became known as the displacement of indigenous peoples, a process of genocide, were in effect instruments of extraction. How to extract wealth from colonized spaces and the people, how to plunder the wealth of indigenous people, how to plunder the, the labor of enslaved and indentured people for the purposes of transferring uh, that wealth to the metropolitan center for economic and institutional development. And in all of this, the university or the university sector was absolutely critical. In fact, one might argue that the university sector was not only the handmaiden, but the, 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 the overall incubator for this model of extraction through genocide, slavery, and colonization in general. And why is that? It was within the university sector that the, the ideological and academic tools were developed. The notion of structuring societies along racial lines in a vertical fashion with white supremacy uh, design at the top of that echelon all of that was developed and theorized and conceptualized within the university community. So white supremacy as an organizational tool was very much part of that sociological and anthropological culture that emerged in academia. The economics of it, the economics of colonization, the economics of the relative importance of slavery as opposed to free labor, the arguments that gave form to the legal structures came out of the universities. The economists, the earliest political economists, all the way through to Adam Smith at the middle of the at the middle of the 18th century, all of that economics came out of the universities. The notion that you can define people as property, you can define people as non-human and classify the African people as some kind of subspecies within that anthropology. That literature, that advocacy came out of the universities. And so the universities created the intellectual infrastructure. It created the philosophical superstructure to allow these crimes against humanity to emerge as they were implemented in the colonies. Even at the moment when the system was being dismantled and, form, and, the, and to be replaced by other forms of labor, uh, contract labor, market wage labor, all of that relative argument came out of the universities that provided the slave owners and the plantation colonists with the form of reasoning to justify what they had done and what they were doing. And the universities in turn were benefiting from that. 
the slave owners compensating them for their hard intellectual work. They received massive endowments from plantation owners and slave owners. They invested in their plants and their infrastructure. They helped to modernize universities. Some slave owners had, to, had their preferential universities. As you know, I have worked with many universities uh, in this process over the years of trying to reposition themselves in the context of this history. Hull University, my alma mater, built around the legacy of Wilberforce. Hull University established an institute funded by the British government, the Wilberforce Institute for the Study of Slavery and Emancipation. The acronym is WISE. At the opening ceremony, I asked a question, should it not be called the Wilberforce Institute for the Study of Slavery, Emancipation and Reparations, in which case the acronym would have been WISER. <laughs> um, I, I participated in the conversation with Glasgow University. I'm an honorary graduate of Glasgow University, but mm -hmm. they were up to their shoulders in endowments and other forms of financial benefits uh, from the slave owning complex. They researched their history, they looked at it, and they invited the conversation. And out of that conversation came a joint institute that has responsibility for a reparatory justice program. And out of that, we agreed that this joint center between the UWI, the University of the West Indies and Glasgow University would identify areas for reparatory action in, in the form of collective research, collective teaching and learning, joint degree programs and research into the legacy of colonization that could be considered to be of a repartory justice nature. That process is ongoing. Each university is looking to see how best it can contribute to recognizing that there is a need for them not to research and run. I have given a number of, of common, uh, presentations, David, on the concept of research and run, where some universities uh, researching their deep connection, intellectual, endowment, capital, credit, finance, uh, they haven't collected that data, are prepared to run away for it, from it because many of them are ashamed of it. And, and rather than confront and engage in a process of repair through partnerships and the way that universities are best established to do, have that conversation, some are prepared to run away from it. And I've urged universities not to research and run, not to research and run, but to research and restitute research with a view to restitution. That is the best we can expect of universities. Universities are expected to serve the pursuit of humanity at its finest. How can we do that against a background of participating in crimes against humanity? The best way to go forward is to research, reflect, and engage in a process of restitution within the finest tradition of how universities do operate and relate to each other. Thank you, David. Well, thank you, um, Hilary. That was uh, very, very helpful, thoughtful, and on point. Can I just prompt you in a few areas? Um, one is, I had not fully gripped an issue that lay at the heart of what you said, which is not just obviously the scientific racism that was pushed by university, but it was also the symbiotic relationship between those that did the exploitation in the plantations, the landed families, um, and of course the research that lay behind that. And of course, as there was a move towards abolition, it's a bit like what we now learned about the tobacco country, companies. As the world moved away from tobacco, you find the tobacco companies funding research to prove that tobacco is less dangerous. And I suspect that there was a sort of symbiotic, I think you're underlying a symbiotic relationship in which you actually find that, that universities found themselves in part and in places fighting those abolitionist tendencies. Well, yes, because the universities took part ownership for the structure of slavery. That by providing the, the intellectual and the, the academic and the political narrative 
that helped to sustain it for hundreds of years and empowered some of the richest people in all of the societies of Europe. And many of these individuals were graduates of universities. The slave owners themselves sent their children to receive the best education in Britain. And many of them who were absentee had the finest access to teaching and learning that Britain and Europe could provide. So they were all connected into a circle of commitment to, to slavery. And at the moment when the British state was contemplating the movement to restructure its relationship to the plantations and to the colonies by the abolition, the universities found themselves uh, divided on the question. Uh, those that were committed and long involved uh, helped to dig in and to, to, to empower those who were benefiting to maintain the system, to sustain it. And all of that took place so that the Emancipation Act itself was surrounded by the, the role of professors and universities literally on both sides of the divide. Those who were saying it's a perfectly good system, let us dig in. It is bringing in tremendous benefits to, to Europe, to Britain, leave it alone. Uh, there's no role for morality to transcend economics. But then you had those economists who were saying, well, Adam Smith came on board. He, you know, great professor of economics uh, in Glasgow, and he said, listen, the fact of the matter is that slavery has performed its role. It has made us rich. It has made us powerful. The colonial trade has given us global dominance. The extraction of wealth from the African people, immoral though it might have been, have given us tremendous boosts in the world competitiveness. But the time has come to transition the slave labor system to a free labor system. So I'm going to demonstrate to you that in order to maintain the exploitation of the colonies, we need to shift the labor system. And he presented the economics to show that uh, a black person in the Caribbean was going to be more productive if we give them a wage as opposed to have the whip over their backs on the day-to-day -day basis. So he provided a modern form of economics to show that extraction can continue, but it can continue without the immorality of slavery. And that was economics 101 coming from one of the finest professors uh, within the system. So there was no moral condemnation. There was a matter of finding how can we maintain the extraction of wealth from the colonies to continue to drive Britain and European development. And so the result of that economics was that the universities, London especially, assisted the British government in crafting an Emancipation Act in which the slave owners received compensation and not the enslaved. So the European model of emancipation was, how can we change the ownership of black people into a market relationship? by the wage mechanism. And at the same time, we are taking away the property of the, of the slave owner and compensating them for property loss. The critical thing here, David, is this, is that the Emancipation Act of Britain and all the Emancipation Acts in Europe were the first occasion on which the parliaments absolutely agreed unanimously that black people were not human beings, but property. Because having agreed to pay property compensation, you can only agree to pay property compensation if you accept that the people you are taken away are indeed property. And the property compensation legislation would recognize that you are extracting property from a citizen, you must give them back fair market value. And so the Emancipation Acts, I have described them as the most racist legislation that has come out of the parliaments of Europe, Britain especially, because it was the first time conclusively that there had been trying to fudge it for many, for many centuries, but they couldn't fudge it anymore. We have 800,000 Africans in the British Empire. There are slaves, there are enslaved people, they are the property of British citizens and institutions, as well as the state because the British government was also the owner of thousands of enslaved people. And so we are going to take this property away from these institutions, pay them property compensation. But first of all, we had to admit that they are not human, uh, but property. And that and legacy continues. 
And of course, there were individuals uh, within Cambridge that benefited from that financial contribution. And I think Cambridge colleges that benefited. Can I just prompt you on something else, which is as a university like Cambridge reflects on what it can do, quantum will be attached to that. Some of that requires an understanding of where a university like the University of West Indies sit. I'm uh, on the board of the University of Guyana, which has certainly not got a lot of money. What does what does repair look like? Um, clearly, it's got to be a relationship that runs over many generations. This is not a quick fix, but but there will be those that are nervous about quantum or attaching a figure to that. It'd be very helpful for you to give us your observations on that and what it really means for universities like the University of the West Indies. Well, within the university sector, there is a serious concern that this is a, a, narr a narrative that requires mm -hmm. integrity on both sides. What we are absolutely trying to avoid is a notion where the slave owning society and the society that benefited from this extraction and, and pillage controls the narrative so completely. The enslaved people had no control over the narrative of emancipation. They said, actually, we, we need to be compensated. The enslaved were saying we are the ones who should be compensated. The British state says, um, as we were saying in the Caribbean, hush your mouth. You have no voice. You should be grateful that we are emancipating you. So be silent and be still. That was the response to the enslaved people of the Caribbean. And so here we are now 150 years later and the legacy is so strong. And we're here in a similar attitude, hush and be quiet. And we will tell you what the narrative will be. We will shape it for you and you can take it or leave it. Now, in the context of my own university, my university, and all of its campuses was built on slave plantations. So for us, the narrative is so immediate, David. I remember five years ago here at, no, seven years ago, here at the Mona campus in Jamaica. The Mona campus is built on the Mona slave plantation. And we were building out a medical faculty complex, beautiful state-of-the-art medical faculty. And when the contract took in to begin to excavate the soil to construct this building, all of these bones began to come up from the ground because nobody knew that that site was a shallow grave for thousands of Africans. And all of these bones just came up from the ground. It was horrific. It was a horrific development that this was a plantation owned by English families for years. And English families had owned this estate. And these bones began to come up from the ground as if the past was speaking to us on the campus. And it was really saying to us on the campus, we will not allow you to forget us. And all of these bones came up from the ground. So those who said, oh, slavery is a long time ago. Well, no, we are, we are in the day-to-day -day moment of discovering the horror and the evil, even within the physical spaces of a university. So we know of the extraction of the wealth, but now we are discovering also in our perimeter, in the middle of our campus, we are discovering all of these horrors of, of slavery through the excavation of, of people who were thrown into shallow graves. So the conversation therefore has to be balanced. But what I can say to you is that when universities speak about reparatory justice, they don't speak about a financial transaction. Because for us, this is not a matter of financial transaction. This is a matter about how do we tell the truth? How do we ensure that these legacies are addressed? How do we put this behind us and move on? How do we find that level of moral and intellectual closure? How can we have acceptance negotiation and build in partnerships so that we can have ethical relationships going forward? because the universities are becoming closer and closer through all kinds of mechanisms and all universities are bonding together. But what is standing in our way is this history that we now have to confront. So it's not financial transaction about how much and what, it's about how do we work it through research, teaching, advocacy, joint projects, cleaning up the mess, 
how do we confront the mess and clean it up? How do we do it together? One of the aspects, for example, uh, between the UWI and Glasgow is this issue of hypertension, diabetes in the Caribbean. For 300 years, the people of the Caribbean were told to eat what you grow. Well, what were we growing? We were growing sugar. Sugar was our number one product for 400 years. And the people ate what they grew. The black people in the Caribbean now have the highest per capita rate of amputations in the world as a result of compli complications from diabetes. Mm -hmm. There's a diabetic explosion among the black community. 65% of all the black people in the Caribbean over the age of 50 have diabetes or hypertension. This is horrendous. Now, how do we deal with that? We have the science. We know what needs to be done. We have the science. We have the medicine. We have the biochemistry. But do we have the resources for the big laboratories to generate drugs that are suited to the DNA of the people of the Caribbean? That's a joint project. Glasgow and UWI have said, let us see how we can work together to find a solution going forward. These are the kinds of projects that universities are looking for and helping their countries to partner to solve problems within the legacy of slavery and colonization. So Hilary Beckles, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. Olivet, over to you. Thank you very much, David. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I would like to start with a rhetorical question, really. How does one repair when damage caused are not even acknowledged at a basic level? And even when that history is acknowledged, it is still relegated to an exercise in saviorism and good sentiments that do not go beyond the sphere of commiseration. Now, I really don't want to sound um, pessimistic because I am not. I just want to bring to your attention the fact that the work on reparative justice is delayed by distractions about whether that past truly existed or if it did, whether the damage were really that extensive. We keep hearing, well, Asia was colonized and they bounced back. Africa and the Caribbean still can't follow. It must mean this and that. Often they insert something to do with so-called scientific racism. In Britain, the papers are constantly engaging on debate about empire and how Britain abolished the slave trade. We are bombarded by attacks on those who are trying to uncover the role of institutions. Attackers present themselves quite often as the leaders of free speech and attack those they call the work brigades or PC gone mad gangs and so on. When we hear those loud voices, the temptation is great to educate them. There is indeed a crucial part of education that needs to play a role in this journey towards repairing. But I also believe that we need to choose which aspect to address and current debates are distracting us, or at least some of us, from the work that needs to be done. What work is it? Well, Sir Hillary talks about the role played by the university or universities in theorizing racism. And I would add that because of 18th century economists, Sir Hillary mentioned, 21st century British universities are key players in shaping economic structures that are actually at the very core of systemic racism. Now, I want us to consider two roads for reparative justice in relation to European colonial enslavement. One is here in Britain, and the other ones are in the Caribbean and in Africa. The past has constructed a, a hierarchy of inequalities and people of African descent are at the bottom of that hierarchy and at the bottom of social ladder. While universities have the duty to address that, some have created scholarships and bursaries for people of African descent, but when you dig deeper, you will see that some of these are drops in the ocean. Financial support for a few months or even a year for a three-year degree for a young person struggling at so many levels is simply not enough. 21st century Britain needs to do better and can do better. Others have addressed the question of lack of diversity in their academic staff by creating that one job that is supposed to show willingness to address inequalities. The expectations is that that one person will solve racism, become a mentor for black students, be the face of diversity for the university, 
fight against the many hues of white supremacy from within, while of course, carrying out all the other duties expected from all academics. The pressure on that one person is immense and in the age of heavily unionized UK universities, well, that one aspect of workloads and its impact on physical and mental health are absolutely on no one's minds. Structurally, quite often no thought have been given to long-term plans with regard to recruitment and to support those who um, are supposed to single-handedly break the glass ceiling that prevents people of African descent from having access to those academic posts. All this actually results in exceptionalizing black academics rather than opening the door for more of them and repairing the damage of exclusion. The third point I would like to make uh, is the question of partnerships with the Caribbean as mentioned by Professor Beckles and David. I think that that dimension is incredibly important and many universities that don't just research and run to use Professor Beckles term are nonetheless completely avoiding that conversation. It is about those who are here, of course, as much as it is about those who are the descendants of those who were subjugated, forcibly made to contribute to a ruthless wealth building industry. UK universities must work with Caribbean universities and with African universities. Equitable, robust partnerships are the very first step, I believe, towards uh, reparative justice. The last point I would like to address is the pandemic. It has shown that Yet again, the most economically deprived people in Britain were and are the ones who are the most affected by this pandemic. People of African descent, people of Asian descent are on top of this list. Many universities were given the rule of working on the COVID vaccine. The very same universities that benefited from the work of subjugated African centuries ago and that were able to become powerhouses for research, knowledge, technology, and so on, are not sparing a single thought about what reparative justice in the age of COVID-19 looks like. Well, this conversation needs to happen. This is yet another opportunity to rethink reparative justice and health equity. Oliver, thank you very much. Oliver, just a few questions. Um, what would you say to those that say, look, this is hundreds of years later, um, you know, you get this pushback in chunks of the British population. This is not my issue. This is not, I wasn't around. And also, I guess, because there's quite understandably in Britain, a real um, live debate about class and about the position of white working class communities in this country during the period of enslavement. And it's very hard to argue that they, they were getting a fair crack at the whip at that time. What do you say to those that say, look, why are you coming to me? Or is it in fact easier for universities? Because of course, when you're talking about um, Cambridge University, clearly you're talking about an elite institution. No one would say it's been impoverished or struggling at any point in its history. So to those who are talking about the fact it was a long time ago, it was indeed, but the past has an impact on the present. And the past is based on uh, scientific racism, economic uh, deprivation, and people of African descent have been suffering from those uh, problems uh, on top of the racism that has become completely endemic uh, at all levels. So it is something that still affects us. So we can't just discard the fact the past as something that happened a long time ago. Uh, in terms of those uh, communities that are also affected, class has indeed played a crucial role. But I just wanted to address this question of very divisive question of the white working class. Uh, many people within the white working class were actually abolitionists. So can we stop thinking uh, in those terms as if they were not involved at all in that fight and that it was all to do with middle class, upper class abolishing the slave trade and fighting for equality? The Chartist movement in the 19th century were made of of course, working class people and black people as well. The second point I would like to address in that, in that, um, in response to what she's saying to your question is the fact that, you know, class affects us, but race affects us. It's two things, we have two things that are completely crushing 
uh, people of African descent. And it needs to be acknowledged. It's not a competition. Nobody is winning in this competition. So it's about coming together and actually fighting against inequalities, all sorts of inequalities. So I think we can do that. Thank you for that. And, and one last um, question. Um, and that's about what does it take? Glasgow University have found 20 million pounds uh, as a way to atone. And of course it's linked to partnerships, the most significant of which is with the University of the West Indies. Is that what we're talking about? Are we talking about money? Ah, money is just one aspect. Money doesn't repair the damage, doesn't repair the pain and address the question of trauma. So it has to be something that is um, a holistic view of uh, understanding at least of reparative justice. Glasgow has decided to turn to, towards the Caribbean, but Glasgow and many others also have to work about um, work on the question of repression here in Britain. So it really is not one just, just one road. It needs to be multidimensional and it needs to include so many people in a dialogue. And we need to ask these institutions, what do you think reparation looks like? It's one answer. But we need to address this question by turning to many communities and asking them, what do they think reparation should look like? rather than doing that one uh, train and that, that journey uh, uh, alone. Thank you, Olivette. Sharon. Yes, hello. <laughs> Hi. Being both the current president of the African and Caribbean Society, I think I've got a huge insight into the history and the relationship that has existed between the black student population within Cambridge and Cambridge as an institution. It has been a long complex one where, you know, black people didn't just all of a sudden pop up in Cambridge. We have existed within that tapestry of, you know, academic innovation and growth um, from the likes of Alexander Cromwell all the way up until now. And it's, it's huge to see that we have existed here for so long, but it's the fact that we are now tackling this issue of reparative justice now and kind of really trying to up, uproot this, just this huge issue that we have yet to kind of cover or conquer in, in, in this way before. I think for a lot of students from, who are part of the African and Caribbean community within Cambridge and beyond, there's this huge kind of dichotomy or there's this huge reckoning that you kind of have to go through where it's like, I've worked and I've strived to be here. I've, you know, I've overcome a lot of obstacles with, from the likes of, you know, the press saying that black students don't want to go to Cambridge because there's no hair products or, you know, coming from particular schools where, you know, there's a huge kind of um, gap uh, where black attainment is not encouraged. And there are students who are kind of overcoming all those things only to arrive and realize that, you know, their institution that they're trying to study and they're trying to, you know, thrive in has, is responsible for or has contributed in many ways to the subjugation, the oppression and the, the, the abuse of their ancestors. And that's a huge thing to try and break down. And it's not something that's unique to Cambridge. There's loads of kind of different spheres, whether it's an in industry, whether it's in other institutions where black people are forced to have this reckoning to kind of sit down in front of their institutions and kind of say, this has happened and we are still here and what are we doing about it? And kind of going on from what Olivette was talking about um, with how often these issues of, of reparations are often kind of trivialized, um, whether it's down to just kind of paying a check to just kind of cover up the issue with a, with a grant or with a scholarship or kind of, you know, encouraging kind of black representation in certain spheres, which all of these things are incredibly important, but, you know, it's really important to address how much of a toll this takes on students who are forced to be students, activists, you know, accountability partners for huge institutions and how much of a, you know, a toll that that is on 19, 18 year olds who are just trying to study and, and enjoy. And, and I think we're just a microcosm of a huge, a wider issue. I don't want to kind of be insensitive and try and make it about Cambridge, but I think it's it's just really important that we get to kind of that root word of, of repair and, and repair starts with um, kind of facing the truth, which I think Cambridge is starting to do, you know, with, with the legacies of enslavement inquiry that is going on. There is a way in which it is clear that we are trying to confront what has happened. But I think reparations is always a touchy subject because there's loads of different people with different opinions. Um, but I think off the back of what um, Sir Hilary was talking about, um, this idea of collectivity and of coming together, and it's not just about, you know, 
me, let's say, or, or the African Caribbean society saying, you know, we're the student representation, we're, we're the ones that have been, and our, our ancestors have been hurt, and therefore we need to spearhead this, this project. I think it's really important that we do have an idea of collective, like collectivity and coming together and listening to each other. And I think it's it's really great that we're having these kind of conversations now. Um, but I think one thing I'd I'd really like to see it's just a real a sense of exposure. I think a lot of, you know, idea of reparative justice and the importance of it will come with the exposure of, of damage and the exposure of, of the continuity of damage. It's not just something that happened there. And here we just kind of came from this, like, I don't know, from this abyss of, of nothingness. And we, we just happen to have all these issues. It's not like that. It's, I think, through education, through financial, social, communal, um, even physical and, and all these kind of different means there's a way we can um address that past and expose it for what it was but also to collectively take that turn for the better and i'm excited to see how not just you know representatives from um, the african caribbean community within cambridge but you know the african caribbean community in bristol or in um, glasgow or in guyana and along with professors along with people in different industries along with politicians like david lammy how we can all kind of come together and bring about reparative justice that works, not just for one section of society or one section of the black community or one section of people who have been hurt, but for all um, and just to see a better future for our communities. Sharon, one of the things that is exciting potentially about this moment where a university like Cambridge is trying to look holistically um, at what reparation looks like and, and also, um, its history um, in this, you know, terrible, terrible period um, is I've often seen students at Russell Group universities across the country, black students, really take it all on their shoulders. Um, I'm desperate for the black students to get on and be students and do really well and get a first <laughs> um, and get great and exciting jobs and opportunities afterwards. And I arrive there and I find that they're responsible for outreach. They're doing this, they're doing that. And I'm sort of wondering where, <laughs> where are all the sort of paid staff for whom this should be their job? Um, I mean, just, I mean, I obviously don't want to particularize this, but it has been a theme. Definitely. It has been a theme, I think, across higher education for now many years. Yeah, um, I can agree with you more. Um, I think it's it's kind of, there's, there's like a duality within that process where I think obviously very traditional white spaces or institutions like Cambridge, um, in perhaps trying to help or trying to resolve certain um, instances of, of inequality, um, in, in trying to bridge that gap and kind of hear the first-hand experiences of black students or of, of black people, the first place to go is the students. And I can understand where there's a sense of kind of well-meaning and, and in trying to, to have those conversations. But I think I realized this a lot during kind of the wake of um, Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement resurging in the summer, how much was being um, asked of us. Um, and I think, and I think there's also the other side where just us as students we feel a sense of maybe guilt in the sense of th there is any, I, I think it's really unfair and I don't think it should exist, but I think there is a guilt of, you know, I've, if, if I don't speak, if I don't act, if I am not petitioning the universities, if I am not teaching the students and, and, you know, and having these conversations with press and writing about it, if I'm not doing this, then there's a whole generation behind me that are not going to have access to what I have and so there's idea of if I don't then who which is really unfair because there's loads of um you know like you said paid professionals people who are um just you know experienced in these fields who who've had you know longer longer experience than I've been alive in, in, these, in these fields and, and it's it's kind of like there's there's this huge pressure of you need to decolonize the curriculum you need to be the, the, the people of it you need to and it's like and I think that's that stuff like you know this movement of, of you know trying to dissect what reparative justice means it, it just goes to show that that whole process of in which you know people from of, of African descent were were abused were taken were stripped away from their their homes and the legacy that's that's left that that happened over 200 400 however many years and so how is it now that a small community of people within institutions in the space of a year or three years that they're here are expected to do the same and I think 
there is a way in which the burden needs to be taken off because there's of course the mental um the mental health that repercussions and and the you know just th there's just so many things happening to students like us at this age um and you know it's it's something that that burden does need to be lifted definitely and Sharon, one other question um the black population here in the UK makes up 4% mm -hmm. of the country. And of course, we know um, in terms of social mobility, it's poor. Um, so inevitably, when you say, um, when you describe Cambridge University as, you know, a very white space, <laughs> it absolutely is that. And I certainly know whether it's being at the, um, you know, Lincoln's Inn uh, as, a, as a barrister or whether it's being um, uh, in those early days in Parliament or being a minister and trying to get the civil service. I, I, I sympathise with you on that, that, that largely white space. How much would you have gained in your experience at university, and you can think of other fellow colleagues, had you had ways to reach into, for example, the University of the West Indies or the University of Guyana or uh, a, a university in Lagos, if you'd had access to professors and academic, if we could um, times Olivet by 300, if you had an opportunity to be at Spelman or Morehouse, or what would that have, how would, what, how would that have helped you? I think in a weird way, it would have just normalized the process in this weird way of, of course, like having access to that, like infinite, like that, that rich level of, of um, just knowledge of experience of, of, of insight um, would have been incredible. But I think there's a way in which sometimes, you know, just feeling like you are the one in a billion from your community that, that is trying to make this fear, it kind of exceptionalizes yes. um, like why it's based like this. And not, yes. not to well, say- Maybe I should have said, how could it help the institution? <laughs> oh, Cambridge. Not just you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I think I think in this in that sense it exceptionalizes this idea that you know Cambridge is the only place that you can get answers from, or like this is the only source of you know the academics, or, or this is the community, especially as like somewhere to be known as like the best university in the world. This is where all the answers need to come from. But I think having having an established network or community of of like you've just explained would have taking that pressure off of Cambridge in a sense of this is not something it, it, it is impossible for you to, to do this by yourself and it is impossible for you to expect only your students to be doing this with you this is something you are going to need to put in the work to reach out to you know universities who their populations have been affected by this their population have the answers or are the ones that are going to be affected most by whatever reparative justice is to be imposed um, and I think it would have just opened up the conversation a lot earlier and taken off that burden from students and also ensured that change would be done globally because if if the conversation remains internally within Cambridge then the, the any kind of reparative justice that is imposed is only going to be for us and that's pointless like the whole point is that it's a conversation that spans out that you know, the same way that Glasgow and, and Hull have been having these conversations that we are learning from them, they're learning from us. And then we are also teaching, whether it's, I don't know, NYU or um, Yale and then, you know, Lagos. And, and, and it's just having that, that continuous conversation. I, so I think having that so that it doesn't remain this internal, very short lived um, conversation. Great. Let's have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Olivette, have you got any reactions? To what's been said. Yes, I completely and fully understand. Um, I have students from various departments, not history students, uh, science students, uh, engineering students coming to me, uh, black students coming to me and trying to find some, some comfort and some support because they're not finding it in various areas. So it's a question of the burden mm -hmm. that is normally put on them. And I find that incredibly sad it makes me actually angry i've raised that issue several times it makes me angry because they don't have the opportunity to fully engage their students and just enjoy the carefree uh you know uh life that many many others uh, are engaged or are enjoying and i also have to say that uh, it depends on the environment okay all is not horrible it depends on the environment uh from which or from which the university is doing strength from 
I don't know if it makes sense. In Bristol, for example, there's a community that is incredibly active that university cannot ignore. So it means that the university has to compose with the community, various communities in Bristol, and they have to work actually trying to bring communities into academia to teach what the community knows, because there's expertise there in terms of uh, coping, in terms of uh, 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 oral history, and all these stuff are actually beneficial for, for students. It's, it's at you know, early stage, but it's some things that uh, we've been working on and that actually seem to be helping students to, be, to believe it. They're not alone. There's people just around them, just outside those walls that are there for them. And there's a bigger world that we're all standing on because you know, as, as black people, we have survived, we're still here. It means that other people have done the work before us. So we just have to keep reminding uh, people that, that you know, we are survivors, other people have done the work, we are doing the work so that others can stand on our shoulders as well. So it's quite positive. Aaron. Yeah, something I actually found quite, um, I think that one of the most like potent things that I got from um, what Sir Hillary was talking about um, was when he was addressing kind of um, the emancipation policy and how he kind of even, I think he defined it as like one of the most racist policies, um, just with the idea of, of how, you know, there was that tr transition in the way that labor operated or just because black people were now getting a wage that it meant that they were still being seen as, as property. And I think it in and of itself, that that is a, a huge example of um, uh, just racism and then continuity and, and just how that has implications today. But it kind of made me think about just even how we approach reparative justice um, in general, because it, it is easy to kind of, you know, have these, not that they're surface level or, or they're not as like abusive in the same way that the emancipation policy was, but I think, you know, just trying to get real like deep rooted changes and just maybe a scholarship like what um, Oliver was talking about or, or just kind of just something that on the surface like looks like it is reparations, but then, isn't and just maybe maybe it's just a question I can pose about like targeting that that like root issue that isn't because I yeah because I think that's why people even tend to kind of like sometimes you know screw their face over it, the idea of reparations is just like you just want to check or you just want do, do you know what I mean and how we can kind of steer away from that it seems to me that the starting point obviously once you've examined your history the contribution that the institution has made, and that's going to be a, a, a lengthy process. It's going to go on over time, it, and in part, it's going to be a painful pro process. But once you've done that, then, like all research projects, you're then assembling the very best that you can partner with, uh, again over 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 a serious amount of time. And I think that this subject of reparations and um, restorative justice, if you like, is clearly um, a generational one. So this is a this is a long term commitment that 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 goes beyond a current group of academics in any institution. Um, but you are assembling the people that you can partner with, and now there are I, I name check some of them, but there are an, a, actually an immense amount of both institutions and people globally. Um, you're committing to that journey. Of course, it, it involves resource and uh, um, and money, but I think more than anything, it 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 it, it it it's almost like that quest to find the sort of DNA sequence, or to to um, you know we we got we got to come up with a vaccine now. It, it, it it's a serious endeavour that that you you're serious about and determined to do. And it and it and 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 it's going to take it's going to take you on a serious journey where you learn as an institution a lot, you have to face a lot, and you educate a lot. But you also, I think, if you're a preeminent institution like Cambridge University, you recognise that what you're doing is catalyzing both within your country and globally. Um, um, so affects many many others, and so it's a serious position of leadership. That you're taking and I and I think uh, given this particular moment um, uh, at this particular time um, it's it's sort of very necessary. Is there anything else that we 
uh, are burning to say? I'm Go burning on. to say that this is not just a journey that is uh, between Britain and, uh, and the empire. You know, it's a European problem and it's a European history and it's time that they all take responsibility for this. And I think that, you know, the European countries have been sticking together not to really address it. And we're playing into that hand because we're not connecting with other European groups that are doing the same work. And I think that um, there's, there's, well, there's strength in, in numbers and we should do that as well. I think that's very, very true. Um, it also strikes me that in 2034, we hit this other period where we actually commemorate emancipation and, and reckon with what that was. And effectively it was, um, yes, um, the end of um, slavery on, part, on, on plantations, but it was clearly um, a different kind of labor because it was a very impoverished labor. People left with no money at all uh, and still had to work um, and set up, if you like, and certainly didn't dismantle Jim Crow and the racism that created um, slavery in the first place. But that is a significant moment and we need to really be in a place where we are more united, there's more coming together and clearly that is a, is a European wide conversation, it's not just a conversation unique um, to the UK. Yeah, and I think kind of off the back of that as well, there has to be, I think this is kind of more relating with the um, educational um, aspects that especially um, Sahili was talking about, but in January that we've all kind of addressed, there has to be, and I think it's probably something that has to be ingrained within actual institutions like Cambridge and so on, just some type of journey of where both worlds have collided, if that makes sense. And the, like, there's, there's loads, or in the context of, I'm a history student, so in the context of Cambridge, we do have papers where it's about, you know, the transatlantic slavery or, or um, at tracing Africa, pre, like pre-colonialism within colonial Africa and then post-colonialism but I think there isn't um enough maybe kind of showing connecting the dots they're all kind of presented as like isolated events um and so that's where people tend to I don't even think it's that people think that slavery happened a long time ago but it's like it's ended now what um and so how we can maybe and I think it is going to come down to education but how we can kind of show that there was never a break or there was never a pause it's just a long line that's kind of gone like this, but there's never been separation. And that's with all countries, especially, um, you know, with like globalization and like now there's diasporas of us like living or diaspora communities living in European ex twins like um, colonizer nations kind of thing. I always say, uh, I think we've done it throughout this conversation. There've been different moments where we have individually described ourselves as black or talked about the black community. Uh, and of course, we hold on to that in a way as a, as a, a, as a badge of pride. However, and there is a however, um, what I am is of African descent. The adage black begun several hundred years ago. Uh, and um, in a sense is the birth of scientific racism. Um, and I, I, I long for a day and I, I, I don't think I'll live to see it, but I certainly hope this is the case for those who come after me when we can return to being of African descent. And it's not about being um, black. It's not about that adage and the others, including the N-word and others that were ascribed to people who look like me. Um, uh, and therefore uh, uh, set up a discourse which we are still stuck with today. Uh, when Black Lives Matter, in a sense, really matter, we will begin to move on from even that adage. But maybe we'll end there. <laughs>